Hey guys, what's happening? Leroy Kenton here. You're watching FTD Speaks. Now, a lot of you wanted to see part two of the unconventional Aussies video where she's sharing her revert story to Islam. So I found it. I'm going to be doing that right now. Let's take a look. She has such an amazing story, guys. So watch it until the end, please. And then I'm going to share some of my thoughts afterwards. Hey everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I'm Natasha the Unconventional Aussie and today this video is going to be part two of my journey to Islam. If you haven't seen part one of this journey then I would really recommend you going back and watching that first because I will mention things in this video that might not necessarily make sense if you haven't seen that first part. Yeah, it's a good so video. If you haven't seen I'll it, it I'll see you back here soon. If you have seen it, let's get started on part two. So where we left off in the last video was where I was having a really big internal conflict because my husband posed a question to me and that question was, could I just forget about everything that I had learned and everything that I had read and carry on with life as, as I knew it? And obviously the answer was no, but I needed to kind of think about why I wasn't committing to Islam, the real reasons, be like honest with myself and figure out why I wasn't making that commitment. So I went away and I pondered on this and it was kind of during that time that I realized the main reasons I wasn't accepting Islam was because I was worried about how life as I knew it now would change, um, such as wearing the hijab, dressing modestly, simple things about not being able to wear nail polish, obviously because of like cleanliness and when we pray, little things like that that I would do on an everyday basis that I would have to um, give up. And then it goes on to I was worried about how it might affect my friends and my family's relationships mm -hmm. with me. That's a big concern. And also concern. how society would see me. Eventually, if I do start wearing the hijab, inshallah, then yeah. how, would they, how would they see me? Because obviously we know that Islam does have a negative stigma to it and I will be associated with that. So how will I deal with that, being who I am and being that I do care a lot about what people think of me? So I had these thoughts. These were my concerns. A few days had passed and I went back to Osman and I shared these with him. And he was really supportive of me on these and he was totally understanding. and was like, well, yeah, you know, your life will change. Um, but it is a progressive change. It doesn't have to happen overnight. I'm not going to have to, you know, I say I accept Islam tomorrow. I'm not expected to wear her job straight away. I'm not expected to drop everything and just expect to be a perfect Muslim straight away like that's that's not expected of me um so that was really comforting to hear because and I didn't just hear it from him I heard it from a number of people who are um, practicing Muslims and they all said the same thing like it is a very personal journey and everything comes in its own time like you don't have to just do everything all at once because i will overwhelm myself yeah and that yeah like i said it was really comforting to hear from multiple people um and then in regards to the other things about you know evidently like it is i'm caring about what other people think of me and at this point in time, I think it's important to mention that we had a really impactful bereavement in the family at um, around this time, and it really hit hard. It hit us hard. And this kind of led to Osman posing to me another question. And that question was, if I was given six months to live, would I continue on life as I am now, hmm. you know, caring what people think, or would I accept Islam because that's what I believed and be the best Muslim that I could be. And straight away I was like, well, no, I would accept it. I wouldn't care what people think. I would accept Islam and be the best Muslim that I could be because I would want to earn my place in heaven. And that was really crucial for me because I clearly believed in paradise and I clearly believed in hell. And I knew that I would want to be in, I would want to be in paradise or heaven. And then obviously I start to think about, okay, so if that's, if that's what I believe, then I'm starting to, then I'm starting to look a bit deeper into my beliefs. And, you know, I was really believing that we are here for a purpose and that purpose is to earn our place in the hereafter. This life is very temporary and 
we need to do everything that we can in this life to be the best people that we can be to earn our place in heaven um and that at that point i was starting to get really scared and i was starting to feel really sad for not only the person that we just lost because they weren't muslim but -hmm. also for my family and friends who aren't muslim and i'm thinking okay what's going to start what's going to happen to them now like and that was a really crucial part, a point in for me because I was already thinking uh, and feeling scared for them. So I was obviously really believing. In my heart, I was really believing. And this, like this belief and these feelings just got stronger. And obviously, when I'm say when I'm saying, okay, so we're here for a purpose. And that, along with that purpose, there should be clear instructions and clear guidance for us to then live this life to earn our place in the hereafter. And those instructions and guidance should make sense to me and should speak to me. And for me, that was the Quran. And it it really spoke to me and it sat well with me. And I will do a separate video, inshallah, on why I feel like the Quran spoke to me a bit more than what the Bible did. And that, that I mean, I could talk about that for ages. So I will hmm. do a separate video on that, inshallah. Maybe and, we'll react to it too. Yeah, so I was, <laughs> I was believing in these things and th- that just overcame my feelings of caring what other people thought of me. It just got to a point where I still care what people think. Don't get me wrong. I, st- I still worry about what people think. I, th- I think I always will. But my faith and what I really cared about was overtaking that. And I really started to feel that. So now I needed to kind of tackle the concern that I had with how would it affect my family and friends. And I just needed to kind of dive in deep with that. So... Up until this point, as I mentioned in my first video, I was I started speaking to people and seeking validation from people. But now, because my thoughts had changed and my feelings had grown towards Islam and my faith had grown, I needed to start talking to them a bit more bluntly that this is going to be something that I'm accepting. I am going to be accepting Islam. And... I just needed to ease them into that without just going from speaking about it and saying, you know, oh, yeah, it might be something for me. But at the moment, you know, I'm just supporting Osman to then, you know, next time I speak to them being like, oh, by the way, like I'm a Muslim. It's like, no, like I I needed to ease them into it. Um, So that's what I did. So I just started speaking to them. So I started with my sister and she's really easy to talk to. She's quite open minded. She's done a lot of traveling through the Navy. So she was... um, she was kind of my first point of call because it was a good practice run, essentially. <laughs> so I spoke to her and she was pretty supportive. She just kind of said to me, and I quote, like, you could believe in blue or blue aliens for all she cared as long as I was happy and as long as I was doing this for me. <laughs> she was a bit concerned about the timing of it because during this time, we had obviously had that bereavement. We sold our house and moved We had our second child. We lost our family pet. Um, It got hit by a car. Um, What else? Something else. Two other like big things happened during this time. And so there was a lot going on. And so she was just a little bit concerned that it was just all too much too quickly. But she she was pretty supportive. It does it does turn out that when I actually did accept my shahada, uh, sorry, accept Islam and take my shahada. She wasn't as supportive as what she thought she was going to be. Mm. Um, But I will do a separate, like a next video on that. Um, I did think that this was going to be two parts, this video of my journey, but it will have to be three parts. Um, There's so much here. Sorry. Coming out after this, where I'll talk about the reactions um, of my family and friends after I take the Shahada. Yeah. But yeah, so she seemed pretty supportive and was easy to talk to. I then approached my um, my dad and my stepmom, and they're really chilled out. They're really easy to talk to, and based on the conversations I've ha- had up until this point, it was really funny because they actually said to me in the conversation, they were like, so, you know, 
how's your reading going? You know, how's Oz going? Um, you know, based on everything you've been reading, do you think you'll be um, reverting to Islam? <laughs> and I just, I, I was just so shocked. I was just like, um, yeah, p- probably. <laughs> like I was just, it was, I was just so taken back for it that they had really been listening to what I'd been saying to them and paying attention. And they'd obviously been seeing how happy I was and just how content I was becoming. And they just like flat out asked me if I would be based on those conversations. And that was really special. And that was really warming for me. Um, So that was an easy conversation. And then I spoke to my mum and my stepdad, who I predominantly grew up with. Now, up until this point, I was being very um, gentle with them. So I, they obviously knew that Osman was practicing again. They knew that I was reading and that I was supporting Osman in that. And they knew that, you know, I was enjoying um, what I was learning. But although they were listening, I think they were being blissfully ignorant in that they were pretending. I think they could see that my heart was moving towards Islam but they were sort of pretending like they weren't seeing it, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so now I started to need, I needed to start being a bit more clear and a bit more obvious with them. So I did in this next conversation, I I can't remember exactly what I said, um, but it was a bit more obvious. I was a bit more forthcoming with my feelings towards Islam and, you know, how it was really speaking to me and how I was, it made a lot of sense to me in comparison to what I learnt um, at church and in school. And my mum was just kind of like, well, you know, that's really great that you're supporting Osman and that you're learning all of these things to support Osman, but make sure you stick to your faith. Make sure you stick to your religion and what you grew up with. Don't be swayed. Um, don't be brainwashed, um, you know, don't let it overcome you because you've got your, you've got your beliefs, your, you can have different beliefs to Osman that you don't have to change yours to be the same as him. And she was very, very, um, trying to be very persuasive with that. Mm-hmm. Typical arguments I, I just I've heard to this all, quite often. I, I, it's not like I've been a. Re- I wouldn't say that I I'm a religious person, Mum. Like I I haven't exactly had um, my faith up until these conversations that we've been having. Um, I haven't been to church in a long time, and then she would go, "Oh, but you, you know, when I visited Australia, um, you know, we went to Christmas mass, and she she really started digging oh. for things." Yeah, and I was like, "No, Mum, like." You know, I can appreciate what you're saying, but it's just, you know, it's just not right. Um, and, you know, it, I was being so patient with her because I know that it, it would have been so hard for her to hear. But again, she was she remained in that blissful, blissfully ignorant phase in her mind where she knew exactly what she knew exactly what was going on and she knew exactly what was to come. But. She just kind of, I think what she was thinking was if she just ignored it, if she just pretended, then it'd be fine, you know. Mm-hmm. And so the conversations after that, again, you know, I was I was doing my best to ease her into the idea of me accepting Islam. Um, but she was just really resistant. Um, and then obviously her reaction to when I took my Shahada is going to be in that third video that I mentioned previously. So there will be that part three, it will be in there. And that was kind of where all this emotion exploded out of her. So definitely keep an eye out for that video. Um, But yeah, so I now kind of covered the, my, my, my family. And then I spoke to a couple of friends and again, they were really supportive. Um, they had the same concerns as my sister. They were worried about timing with everything that had been going on in my life. And they were just concerned that I was doing this for Osman and not for me. Um, but over the conversation, previous conversations we had and you know, recent conversations that we'd had, they started to see that I did have a little bit of knowledge and the knowledge that I had was coming from my own research and it was coming from me. It wasn't coming from 
Osman or Osman's family. It was purely this was all down to me and my decision and there was not any like any like um, coercion or anything like that. It was 100% my decision. And once they knew that, they were like, okay, we support you. Like you're still you at the end of the day, which is like really, really important and was so nice to hear. And I remember coming um, home from seeing them and just like telling Oz, I I couldn't wait to, I had to call him and I I called him and I told him how happy it made me feel that the most important people and my support network, because obviously my my family is in Australia still. So my big support network here is my friends and they were really supportive of this up and coming change. And that meant so much to me. So I think it was, so this all, these kind of conversations were happening at like over like the beginning of the week. Um, so like Monday, like Monday to Thursday, I think it was. And then, no, it was Monday to Wednesday. And then on the Friday, I was like, yeah, like I just kind of woke up and I just accepted. I was like, yeah, I'm going to take my shahada. Like this is it. Like I feel good about it. I need to sleep, just just do it. And then um, and then it was obviously, so that was like the Friday and then the week, it was the weekend. So I tried to call up um, Regents Pass Mosque on the Saturday. Um, I think Osman was at work. So I just wanted to call up and I just wanted to have a chat with an imam and just see kind of what they had to say and just get a bit of a feel and just see if this is, yeah, if I'm really going to do this, but I couldn't get through to anyone. So I called Osman's brother's wife and she's a practicing Muslim and she's just an amazing, like an amazing person, such a good role model. And I remember I called her and I just kind of said to her, like, you know, I think I want to take my Shahada. I, but what do you think? <laughs> and we had a really long conversation about it. And I remember her just being so shocked because she'd obviously known me from when I was a bit of a Islamophobic. Um, And to now then me calling up and going, I think I want to take my shahada. Like she was just like, really? (laughs) Really? (laughs) Are you sure? You ready for this? It was, it was so funny. I was like, um, yeah, should I do? (laughs) She was like, no, I'm just like, this is amazing. Like she was so happy. And we just talked out through everything, all the questions that I had, um, just around like surrounding the Shahada and things like that. And then by the end of that conversation, I was like, yeah, I'm like, I'm going to do this. And then obviously the next day was Sunday. So um, I had to wait till like a weekday. Hmm. And then the Monday I woke up and I wasn't thinking about it. I didn't wake up thinking oh, today's the day I, I woke up, not even, it wasn't even in my mind that anything. I just woke up as per normal. I was dealing with the girls, you know, Osman was here. He was on the computer, like faffing about. Um, I was sitting on the sofa and I had the youngest in my arms and I was just watching a bit of telly or something. And then um, something just was like, Shahada, you're going to do it today. Wow. And I just remember, I just got up, (laughs) I just walked out the room (laughs) into the bedroom and I met and I just called up Regents Pass Mosque. They answered on like the second ring, which is just like unheard of from our experiences because we had our, um, our nikah there and trying to get in touch with them to arrange our nikah was just almost impossible. So we'd had a bit of like experience with calling them and it was so like, so funny on the second ring picked up and, you know, I said to the a mom that picked up, I said, you know, I want to take my shahada. And he was just over the moon for me. And he was like, yes, we're here all day. Come in. So I was like, yep. And it just felt so right. It just felt like this is, this is perfect. I came into the living room and I said to Osman, I was like, so we need to ch- change the plans that we have today because I want to take my shahada. And he was just so happy for me. We got ready within the hour. We were out the door within the hour, which is unheard of with two children and um we were on our way up to regions fast mosque we got there and as it turns out it was the same imam that did our nikah and it just made it even more like even more special than what it already was because 
we had that like relationship with him from our nikah and he was so excited to see us he remembered us and he remembered me and he couldn't believe it like he was just over the moon um so yeah it just it just made the day it was awesome um and then yeah i that's that's <laughs> it for this video that's i'm it. gonna end it there and then in part three I'm going to t discuss, as I mentioned just before, I'm going to discuss the reactions of my family and my friends once I'd accepted Islam and taken my Shahada. And ha did that change? Did any of their opinions change? Um, and um, I'll also discuss um, the difficulties I had, like, with you know, did I start praying straight away or kind of what happened with that? Um, and what things do I implement straight away and what things I haven't implemented straight away or what I'm striving towards. So that will all be in part three. Um, so I will see you in my next video. Thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for your support. It's been absolutely overwhelming. All the comments and the suggestions, they've been really helpful. So please keep them coming. Don't forget to share this video if you think someone might benefit from it. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you soon. Okay, very interesting video. I love seeing the progression of her story. I'm not even going to ask if I should do a react to part three. I know you guys want to see it already, so I'm definitely going to do that. I'll link to part one though of my reaction uh, below in the video description section. If you haven't seen it already, I do highly recommend that episode. And also I'll link to the original video that I just uh, watched with you guys. So the first thing I want to talk about is um, people right and their their support like what she was sh sharing about with her her sister who started off being supportive and then after things uh, developed she wasn't as supportive as before and then her mom started talking about uh just make sure you keep your faith in what you believe in and uh, sometimes that's not actually accurate because your parents or someone close to you say like oh keep your faith like how do they know what your faith is even people in the same religion have different faith sometimes so it's like make sure you stick to what you grow up with and sometimes like i get it from their perspective they're seeing it because they care and they want you to do what's best for you but at the same time we're all individual human beings we all have free will and we should be free to choose based on what makes the most sense to us. So I understand like her dilemma, her uh, experience with her mom and just not having the support and her mom being very, very convincing to her, for her to stick to what she believes in. Yeah, that must have been really tough dealing with that, you know, especially having to do with parents. That's usually the, one of the biggest things that people deal with when it comes to changing religion. I guess it's a little bit easier though, because in part one, she did mention that she lived, grew up in Australia, and then she ended up moving to the UK. But her family, uh, I think she touched on it in this episode, still lives in Australia. So I guess that distance makes it a little bit more easy for her. And she does have her support system, her friends who are 100% actually supportive. Uh, I think Natasha, the unconventional Aussie lady, she did it in a, a pretty smart way where she started telling people bit by bit on what she was doing and she didn't just come out bam, all at once, because I think it would have been a little bit overwhelming uh, for her, just also with what she was dealing with in life, all the different tragedies that she was facing. And at the same time, sometimes going through those big changes have people like curl back into their safe zone. Like, whoa, I told everybody, whoa, look at the backlash. Okay, let me just uh, retreat, retreat, retreat. You know, we do that. So I think sometimes we got to use a little bit of wisdom to kind of just roll it out uh, bit by bit, you know? There's a saying that says, don't bite off more than you can chew. Meaning, don't take on more than you can actually handle. And uh, so I see why she did it the way she did and i don't feel like it necessarily was just her anxiety that was sort of holding her back from telling everybody but also her care and concern for people how they would uh react to it and just all these new emotions coming up sometimes you don't know what you're going to face so you you want to be a little bit cautious coming out even though it shouldn't be a big deal like i'm the first one to say if you believe in something you know go for it regardless but that's not 
the ideal. That's not how everybody sees things like this. All right, so, you know, I guess uh, I'm gonna go and check out part three, see how her story continues. And uh, I think there's gonna be quite a bit more interesting points that are highlighted because now she's gonna be talking about her reaction and no, people's reaction to her after the Shahada. And I know from some of the other videos that uh, reacted to that when you do the Shahada, it becomes like real serious. And then like the real testing begins. So let's see how she handled that, what people said. So look out for that episode, guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Later.